Hello and welcome to this webinar. I believe we have quite a diverse and global audience today, and I suspect that's because, uh, because of the global adoption of open banking as a regulation or as a trend or as an industry-led movement. So before we begin, let me introduce uh, the speakers today. Uh, I am Seshika Fernando, and I head the financial solutions team at WSO2. Uh, the WSO2 Open Banking Solution is one of the key products that we handle, uh, and I'm looking forward to sharing our experiences in creating and managing technology for uh, some of the major banks in Europe uh, in their PSD2 compliance journey. Um, Co-hosting this webinar with me is Chris Michael from the Open Banking Implementation Entity. Uh, Chris, I'm sure you need no introduction to open banking audiences globally, uh, but to be fair by you, I'll let you introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks, Sashiga. Um, so I've uh, been heading the development of the uh, the standard in in the UK. Um, so this is the, the the standard that includes API specifications, but also customer experience guidelines and operational guidelines as well. And we also have been building a suite of tools that help developers from both banks and fintechs test that the, um, uh, the an, an API has been implemented according to the standard. Um, so I've been I've been doing that now for the last three years, um, and yeah, very excited to be talking to everyone today. I mean, this is a kind of we're at a really interesting point. Uh, I just wanted to mention that the standard that we've been developing is a fully open standard. It's actually now a global standard. And to Sashika's point earlier, open banking is becoming a, uh, a concept, a, a reality across many markets globally. And a lot of that now is based on the standard that, that, that we've developed here in the UK. So very proud to be a, a part of this as well. Definitely. All right, thanks, Chris. Um, so let me briefly highlight the agenda for today. Um, so we are thinking back and looking ahead. Uh, this means that Chris and I will talk about our own journeys uh, that we've taken um, as, a, as a standards body, as a technology vendor that created technology for these standards um, uh, in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, and I'll also try to portray the journey that our customers have taken uh, so that we can we we take some time to really identify the challenges we had, how we overcame them, and how other regions can benefit from these early learnings. Uh, and I think, uh, as as you correctly pointed out, Chris, uh, while the concept of open banking is spreading, uh, we have witnessed an increased adoption of uh, the OBIE's uh, open banking standards. Um, and and we've seen that in certain countries they have opted to directly use the standard and some others have chosen to use it as a base and, and localize it to suit their regional needs. Um, so, uh, Chris, uh, you guys must have got a lot of things right uh, to uh, end up with, uh, with, a, with a standard that is spreading globally. Uh, and I'm sure the insights you share will be very useful uh, for both banks as well as regulators of other regions. Um, so, to start things off, would you like to uh, take us through the journey, uh, the lessons learned, and where we are at today? Certainly, yes. So um, the OBIE, or the Open Banking Implementation Entity, was uh, formed in September of 2016. And that's kind of pretty much when I started my journey here as well. And we, we were set up by the UK government in response to the Competition Authority, the Competition and Marks Authority, uh, they did a, a Marks investigation and they uh, decided that the banks needed to open up APIs and they mandated what is called the CMA 9, which is the nine largest retail banks in, in the UK. They mandated that they fund the development of a standard, an open standard, and that the CMA 9 were also mandated to implement the standard. That's rather different from most of the rest of Europe, which is mandated to comply with PSD2, the Second Payment Service Directive, but isn't necessarily mandated to follow any particular standard, or even for that matter, to implement an API. So what, uh, what, what we 
the standard that we started working on and that we created was really designed to be in line with PSD2 to enable the CMA9 to meet their PSD2 requirements, but effectively they were mandated to follow this standard and to do so and to implement this a year and a half or a, 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 a year and a um, yes, a year and a half ahead of the, the PSD2 deadlines, effectively. So the, in the top, you can see we were formed uh, in September, and the the PSD2 came into force in January 2018, which has also coincides with when the CMA9 started to implement the first version of the standard, the read-write standard that, that we created. Um, but we didn't stop there because this first version was very much a minimum viable product. So we've been roughly on six month cycles. We have been iterating the standard to a version two that was implemented by the CMA9 towards the end of, uh, uh, the, end of the summer of 2018 in August. And then we were working on a version three or 3.1 actually, which was published um, uh, in August 2018. And this is the kind of PSD2 compliant API standard, if you like, and what, what's been happening since uh, uh, just over a year ago is that the CMA9 and many other banks in the UK and also across Europe have been implementing version 3.1 to meet their PSD2 requirements, um, which required APIs to be available for testing in March and to be live in the market um, in September just past. Um, there has been a, uh, in the UK at least, an adjustment period, a six month adjustment period, because um, without going to the details, effectively the market hasn't been ready, not just the banks, but uh, the market hasn't been ready. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the kind of challenges as well in that. Um, but in that period of time, we've also been working on um, a version 3.1.1, 1.2, et cetera. So we are iterating the standard um, and, and have been doing so for a while and will continue to do so into next year. And this is um, effectively now, these iterations are doing two things. They are either um, catering for some of the adjustments or clarifications to the regulatory requirements. They're also meeting some additional CMA order requirements, which are not part of PSD2. And also what we are looking at is things that are um, in perhaps the competitive space, but APIs, we, we call them premium APIs, um, looking at um, how those uh, additional functionality that the market wants, how that can be enabled in the standard without it necessarily being a regulatory requirement. So that's where that kind of bar shifts from purple, so blue to purple is that we are moving more into a market enabling phase rather than just a, a compliance phase and um, what we've what we've seen in parallel with that is the adoption of fintechs and end customers in the market um, largely to date has been around account information the read api payment initiation is very early and um, there have been quite a lot of challenges with that and we'll talk about those later but you know we're expecting payment initiation to start to become more uh, adopted uh, across across the market um, uh, during 2020. That's kind of a, a very high level view of the the journey that we've been on, um, and the with the standard and also with the adoption in the market. Right. Um, all right. So um, I think I think this is about you know where we are at today. Do you want to? Mm -hmm. Just yeah. elaborate on yeah. and so we, we we publish statistics on a fairly regular basis on our, our on our website um, and as of the end of uh, last month end of September um, what we're seeing in the UK is um, a, a, a fairly strong healthy um, market so we've got in total 180 regulated providers so this is 116 fintechs who are authorized by the FCA um, in uh, to, so they are they either hold the authorization of a uh, account information or a payment initiation. There's even a, a third category called a CBPII, which I, I won't talk about unless there are any questions. But there's it's a mix of AIS and PIS providers, and there are 64 
uh, banks that are or account providers that are in the UK and uh, largely in the UK and the Republic of Ireland um, uh, that are both adopting the standard and also using our directory trust framework service as well. Um, there are, we believe, a la much larger number of account providers, um, not just in the UK and, and Europe, but also in many other markets, as, as Sashika said, that are using the standard, but this is really just sort of what's, what's happening in the UK. This 64 account providers um, accounts for the vast majority of current account um, and credit card holders. It's probably something like you know, 95% of all customers now have an account with uh, one of these 64 providers. So it's it's certainly the majority of the market. And so what we're seeing is that there's there's quite a lot of adoption. I've, uh, we've got roughly, well, it's getting on towards now 60 of the, uh, oh, but it's 53 at the end of August, uh, end of September, 53 regulated entities who have got at least one proposition live. Some of those are fully live. Some of them are in a process of, going live in test phase, um, and some of those are uh, existing fintechs who are migrating from screen scraping to open banking APIs. Um, and um, that's that's kind of changing on a daily basis, but we are seeing quite a lot of uh, uh, adoption of these APIs. Um, and the, the something that has been widely spoken about is uh, things like availability and performance. Um, now, you know, if you're a, a techie like myself, you look at a figure of 98% and you think that's not a particularly good success rate for API calls. You'd expect to have four nines. And indeed, the market would expect to have four nines. But um, for a variety of reasons, I mean, that's uh, not as high as it should be ideally. Um, the regulations are a little bit um, uh, lax, if you like, in, in this regard. They only require the APIs to be as good as the, the bank's best performing online interface. And um, if, the, if, if the kind of comparison point is screen scraping, then I would argue that you know that's not far off what you get for screen scraping. And in fact, the evidence we've got from FinTechs is that uh, you, when they migrate to APIs from screen scraping, it's a better customer experience, it's more reliable and more cost effective. Um, that's for account information payments is where we have the real challenge so and we'll talk about challenges later but this kind of highlights that we are seeing quite a lot of adoption uh, for account information so this is use cases such as uh, uh, personal finance managers um, uh, accounting packages are really starting to use these now uh, and the other big use case we're seeing is lending based products so um, services which either offer customers a continual monitoring of their spend and, uh, and advise them when to take out or dip into a lending product versus an overdraft or um, decision making around lending. So using open banking APIs to get validation of customer income and expenditure in order to offer customers a loan. And we're seeing those are kind of the, the big use cases that we're seeing at the moment. Uh, but there are a whole load of other smaller ones that are quite uh, quite exciting and um, uh, you know could 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 really start to uh, become a uh, a bigger thing. The point I would make is that the very very big API users, the very big regulated entities, we think are likely to be the tech be the big tech giants, the Apples, Amazons, Facebooks, Googles, etc. For their various wallets uh, and and uh, various other financial products, we think that's going to um, really uh, be a, a a much bigger thing uh, next year. Right. Um, I think I'm I'm really impressed with the with this number fifty three because if you really think about it, it's 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 been you know just about a month since the banks have been live with these APIs. Uh, and to have uh, 53, uh, uh, you know, regulated entities with, uh, uh, you know, with live customers, uh, that's quite, that's quite an achievement, I would think. Yeah, I certainly, when, when you compare this to um, what's happening across the rest of Europe, um, Europe mm -hmm. is very much a mixed bag. I mean, you have got um, a, a couple of markets where the banks have produced usable APIs or a couple of 
banks who larger banks in in a market who produce usable APIs. You're starting to get some usage across Europe, but it it is a fraction of what we're seeing in the UK. I mean, the when you talk to the fintechs that are operating across Europe, they will all pretty much consistently say that whilst there are still issues with uh, the, the the kind of quality and availability of the APIs in the UK, it is significantly ahead of the rest of Europe on 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 balance. Yeah, I share the same uh, perspective as well from uh, you know from being on the other side of providing technology for those different standards. Um, all right. Um, so moving ahead, um, I believe these are some of the you know some of the successes and the lessons that uh, you know you um, um, enjoyed or <laughs> came across during your time. Do you want to elaborate? Yeah, sure. So I think you know we've we've been doing this now for um, three th three years, working on this standard. And I say we. This has been a a, a kind of really joint effort, uh, a big a big concerted effort by the industry. So unlike um, the way that many sort of financial service standards have been developed in the past and in are still being developed in other markets, this has not been a bank led or bank driven initiative. We are as as OBI, we are an independent. Uh, entity, we don't represent any one stakeholder group. We try and represent the whole ecosystem. So we have developed this standard in collaboration with literally hundreds of participants. Even I think in total about 2,000 participants have been individuals have been involved, representing banks, fintechs, technology providers such as uh, WSO2, who you know attend regularly our workshops and collaborate to the standards. Um, so this the the standards are not just API specifications. They are um, we have developed in collaboration with the Open ID Foundation. We've developed a security profile, which is a truly global profile, which is the basis of the standard that's in most markets now globally, or becoming uh, the, the basis of that. We've also I mentioned earlier developed customer experience guidelines. These uh, lay out what steps and um, information TPPs and banks should uh, either ask uh, for or present to customers during the authentication journey for both AIS and PIS. Um, now the, the, the regulators are very keen on this construct of banks not putting additional obstacles in, in the way of a customer when, when they're going through these various journeys and so what we've done is brought that to life with our customer experience guidelines and um, that's kind of a key part of the standard that, in fact, many other markets are now also looking to uh, retrospectively fit in. Because um, you know, if, if if you're not very, if you're not reasonably prescriptive about that, what you find is that some banks have put in lots of extra steps and created lots of extra friction in in the process. Um, and kind of along those lines as well, what we found is that banks have interpreted the specifications very differently. Uh, mm -hmm. And they've decided in some cases to ignore different clauses or different requirements that are maybe mandatory or they've formatted stuff differently from the standard. And I think that's an area where I feel quite passionate that, you know, the standard is there for a reason. Um, fine, if there is a data object or field that isn't relevant to a particular account, then it's an optional field and shouldn't doesn't need to be presented. But if it says the field should be... 30 up to 32 characters or whatever it should be up to 32 characters if it says the field should be called this or it says uh, that message payload should be signed it should be signed with this algorithm etc so the standards there for a reason and what we found is that um, there was even though it was quite well defined there were quite a lot of variances and so what we started working on a couple of years ago um, is a set of conformance tools so we've got with the Open ID Foundation, we've worked on conformance tools for the security profiles, and we've mm -hmm. developed our own conformance tools for the functional APIs, and they simulate a TPP um, uh, request and, and uh, allow the bank to download and use these tools to simulate the entire uh, and an, an in, uh, entire set of API calls, and they provide a, um, a validation, a set of results that says whether each of the calls is a pass or a fail. Um, all of these tools are open source. They can be used by anyone who's got access. They can either be used 
to test against the test environment or they can be used against the production environment if 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 the um, person who's testing has got both the certificate that gives them access to the API and a set of credentials to access a specific account. So <clears throat> they are these tools, I cannot emphasize how important they are because what we found is that when, as I said, when banks were implementing APIs, they weren't doing it consistently. And what we've got is a much higher level of consistency now by having these, these tools in there. Um, we've also got a trust framework, which is a, uh, a directory and a, a certificate authority that um, really helps banks and fintechs see, you know, discover where the endpoints are and helps also automate the connection. Um, in, in some markets in Europe, we're seeing TPPs reporting it takes between two weeks and two months to connect to a bank. That's just not <laughs> good enough. Um, you know, we, we think it should be completely automated and we've um, tried to simplify that through the trust framework. It's called the Open Banking Directory in the UK. Um, and the last thing is the market engagement. I and mean, we, we put a huge amount of effort into providing um, help and support to um, banks and fintechs. Help, you know, we run regular weekly um, working groups where we uh, have in a very open forum, we have banks and fintechs talking about any specific issues. And we also have a service desk that helps um, banks and fintechs raise specific issues with each other. Um, and we provide a sort of central place for that so that is it is very useful. So all, all of these things we found out the hard way because we didn't have them all at the start or certainly, you know, they, 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 they weren't all up and running at the start. And so what, you know, our, our kind of recommendation to any other market that's doing, uh, doing open banking or open anything for that matter is you need to have these things in place. You can't just rely on having a, set of API specifications and expecting things to work because they just won't. It, it'll be, it'll take a long time. So that's kind of been the, uh, um, the, 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 the I suppose, the key lessons uh, learned. And it's made a huge difference. As I've said, I think the proof is in the pudding in the sense that, you know, we're probably at least a year, if not close to two years ahead of Europe and the rest of the world in terms of where we are with, with open banking. And it's, a lot of it is down to, to all of this. I completely agree with you, Chris. Um, and I think, especially with in terms of market engagement, uh, I, th I think we are we, we are one of the biggest beneficiaries of that, um, as as we were able to. I mean, we had a channel uh, that we could use to get so many things clarified, not just in terms of not just with regards to the specification or the or the standards, uh, but also you know clarifications around the regulation. Sometimes uh, those clarifications even benefited our um, some of our, uh, you, you know, European uh, banks uh, who required that and had no uh, channel uh, to get those clarified. Um, just out of curiosity, uh, Chris, uh, when you were talking about the um, the, the standards and the, um, uh, you know, the um, uh, OIDC, the OIDC Foundation and working with them, I, I just I just wondered uh, what kind of contribution that the the standards may have had uh, into the evolution of the financial grade API standard uh, by the um, OIDF. Yeah, no, sure. So I think when 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 we uh, when we started um, looking at this, I mean, originally we were very much um, uh, in 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 sort of two minds as to, uh, and this is going back. Um, close to three years, we were in two minds as to whether or not we would just use a very basic sort of OAuth implementation or do we need OpenID Connect and do we potentially need something else on top? And we um, we uh, solicited the help of a number of kind of leading uh, security and access management experts um, from some of the tech players in the market. Um, and um, we uh, got Ran, ran quite a few workshops with you know, security professionals across the industry from banks and fintechs. Um, and I think we kind of fairly early on started talking, uh, what we realized a lot of these experts were members of the OpenID Foundation. And at the time, the OpenID Foundation had a very rough draft of something called the, the FAPI profile. And at the time it stood for financial API profile. And it was designed to be a very specific profile for banking. And um, 
what what we what we worked on uh, with the Open ID Foundation and the entire market is um, going through several rounds of um, iterations of that profile. Um, we in initially took a um, and we, it's it's still available online somewhere. We initially took a um, effectively a, a slice of the uh, FAPI profile and created an open banking profile that was had some areas of the FAPI profile redacted. Um, mm -hmm. We didn't want to redact the FAPI profile. We thought it set a, an appropriately high level of security, but it, there were some challenges with many of the banks being able to implement it. So rather than, uh, to, uh, rather than water down the FAPI profile, what we did is created our own <coughs> excuse me, open banking profile and agreed to keep it in place for a period of time, but then migrate towards FAPI. And, that's kind of the journey that we're on now. The open banking profile effectively was redacted or uh, is no longer supported. We've encouraged everyone to move to FAPI. And what we've got is, I don't know, roughly half the banks now, or two thirds of the banks still using the open banking profile, but uh, any new banks coming in are now looking to use the FAPI profile. And the um, most of the banks who are using the open bank profile have, have made at least a verbal commitment that they will, over a period of time, upgrade their systems to the FAPI profile. Um, and the important thing there is that this is a profile that has got global vendor support. It's not a UK specific thing. And the governance of that is very much out there in the, you know, open to any, uh, any um, organization or individual who wants to join the Open ID Foundation and contribute. So it's a, you know, it's a, 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 a very sustainable uh, long-term governance model that, that can work across multiple markets. And that, that we felt very strongly that was the right thing to do. And along the way, what actually happened was the FAPI profile was renamed financial grade API profile because we all agreed that it didn't make sense to have a, 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 a lower bar for other sectors. You know, you're talking about customers' data, whether it's financial data, you're talking about payments, you know, you could be talking about any sort of read-write operation for data, yeah. you want to have the same high level of security. So yeah. effectively, FAPI has become the, the de facto standard for, you know, securing APIs. Yeah, that's right. All right, thanks for that. Um, oops. So I just want to move on to, um, you know, WSO2's uh, journey through the PSD2 regulation as well to showcase, uh, you know, what a tech vendor went through uh, as well as um, portray some of the, some of the, you know, the, the, the journeys that our banks, uh, our customers took as well. Um, so we started off uh, our journey sort of in 2017, the beginning of 2017, I would say. Uh, where we basically got into uh, this because many of our existing cust uh, banking customers um, in, in the Europeans uh, in, in Europe were requesting us to assist with their PSD2 compliance um, requirements. So when we looked at the regulation, we realized that um, this regulation is something that we can uh, at, at WSO2 can provide a total solution for since we had all the components a bank would need for compliance. So uh, API management, obviously, for exposing APIs, uh, identity and access management for uh, strong customer authentication and consent management, uh, then uh, our analytics engine for uh, transaction risk analysis, uh, fraud detection requirements, reporting requirements, etc. And of course, the integration platform to integrate with um, some of the legacy core banking systems and other internal systems in order to expose services from those systems. Uh, so that's how we got involved and, and we ended up creating a full solution uh, for compliance. Uh, we got our first customer compliant with the, um, the uh, UK version 1.0. Uh, and, and we got them uh, compliant by January 2018. Uh, they were not a CMA9 customer, but one of the very few banks uh, that was compliant uh, with the version one um, that was available at the time. Uh, and then of course, uh, while we continue to upgrade the WSO2 open banking solution with the latest updates of the UK uh, standards, uh, we also had to simultaneously keep up with other standards uh, that were kind of gaining traction uh, in the rest of Europe. 
such as the next gen PSD2 spec by uh, the Berlin Group uh, and the STED spec. Uh, there were others as well, but these were the two most um, requested from us. So we decided uh, on these two. Uh, and, and obviously, as you would imagine, there were challenges along the way, uh, especially when it comes to the to the European specs, because uh, as as you mentioned earlier as well, uh, Chris, uh, they they are they were provided by independent entities, uh, and are and are not create and are not managed by an appointed body like the OBIE. So dealing with those specifications as well as uh, the broader regulation and how they interact. Uh, with the broader regulation uh, and also uh, taking into consideration some of the country specific requirements um, uh, in addition to all of that was really quite challenging uh, and um, I must also mention uh, as you said uh, as well that from a, a vendor's perspective uh, the availability of a conformance suite for uh, the UK standards was was really really very helpful uh, because that kind of worked as a reference point for, uh, for uh, both us in terms of building the uh, solution, but also uh, to our customers uh, as to you know what we have co imp implemented is actually compliant with the requirements. Um, and and of course we would have loved to have had uh, such a testing capability or a verification capability for the other standards that we were working with at the time, uh, but I believe uh, they're on the cards now. Um, and I guess in, in general, uh, with all the uh, standards up updates that were coming from the three uh, standards bodies, uh, as well as uh, newer requirements in terms of um, custom experience guidelines or reporting uh, requirements, etc., uh, all of these things kept us on our toes, constantly on our toes. Uh, and with a lot of effort, uh, a lot of collaboration with the OBIE, uh, as well as the other standards bodies, of course, um, and uh, patience and cooperation uh, from our customers, we managed to get all our open banking customers successfully PSD2 compliant uh, by last month's deadline. And uh, now, uh, while we continue to upgrade our solution to support the newer versions, of the respective standards. Uh, we're also quite excited about the new business opportunities uh, that the open banking ecosystem is bringing uh, for, 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 for banks in general, as well as other financial services providers. And we're happy to be a part of that journey. All right, um, I think um, it's a good time to uh, discuss something that might be very important to uh, and, and I suppose useful to um, especially um, our viewers from uh, other regions that are in the process of implementing an open banking regulation. Um, the challenges we had, how we overcame them, and what to look out for when creating an open banking roadmap. Um, so I think we've kind of categorized them into um, in the way we can uh, to you know challenges that everyone had challenges that are specific to the third parties and, and the banks um, so I think Chris you and I can um, you know talk about them uh, you know from our different perspectives I'd like to ask you first um, about some of the regulatory gaps and challenges as a standards body uh, how you saw them what you're seeing right now and how uh, that that is probably affecting uh, the stakeholders of the ecosystem yeah sure I, I mean I think um, you know uh, PSD2 and, and and the RTS were written some some time ago, or certainly PSD2 was written some time ago, um, and the RTS kind of um, went into quite a lot of detail in in my in my personal view. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of good intent in the regulations, but um, what what they kind of failed to do was to outline the intended market and customer outcome, and they they kind of define some technical solutions in some detail which um, are challenging either because they're lacking in you know they, they kind of go halfway and leave some gaps or um, you know they can be interpreted differently by different people so you know the, an example is there was um, a um, uh, a very number of very strong use cases for um, 
uh, well, so the, the, the challenge was uh, there was a difference of opinion about what information banks were supposed to provide uh, around an, uh, an account holder. So if you if you go into an online bank uh, banking platform, a website or a mobile app, you typically see or can access things like your name, your address, etc. Now, was name and address supposed to be provided by the API? Because there are lots of use cases where people use bank statements as a as a kind of validation of either um, their address or their income uh, or both and you know there was a point of view that that surely should be something that an api should do if the information is available so one point of view was if the information is available online it should be available in the api and another point of view was that um the uh, the the regulations only talk about you know effectively balances and transactions they don't really talk about other information and and everyone had a sort of different view of this and we we in the standard we made sure that the standard wasn't limiting so the standard enables all sorts of information and what we've what what was clarified a while ago by the eba and subsequently by the fca is that the name of the account holder is a requirement but it doesn't make things like address or email address or phone number or other other contact information a requirement but the name of the account holder or holders because there might be several might be a joint account that is a, a, um, a requirement now that that was clarified quite late on in the day and that's been mm -hmm. a challenge for everyone because the tpps have wanted the information and that was seen as a bit of a compromise but at least they got something that you know they were asking for and the banks it's been a challenge because they they're now m many of them hadn't plans to provide that information and they're now having to provide it so that's just one one example. I mean, there are a whole load of other examples, and still the EBA. I attend the EBA working group every every month or so. It's now I think every three months, and the EBA is still answering questions on their Q and A tool, and the FCA are still issuing clarifications off the back of that. So there, there are you know ongoing um, there's mm -hmm. ongoing movement. The goalposts are kind of moving a little bit, and that's a challenge for for, for both sides, both banks and TPPs. Yeah, and talking about moving goalposts, uh, I think that uh, kind of describes the next two things as well, uh, the evolving deadlines and the version upgrades. Um, so um, I think in terms of evolving deadlines, what I'm referring to is the RTS getting delayed to come into force, and as a result, um, the the um, PSD2 deadline uh, sort of, you know, for, for some time at the start, we didn't really know uh, when the exact deadline was going to be. Uh, and, and of course, in terms of version upgrades, um, as you may have seen in the previous slide, uh, when you're dealing with multiple standards, um, the, the different um, the different versions or the releases uh, were not uh, didn't quite come in a predictable frequency, and of, and for obvious reasons, um, closer to closer to compliance, obviously uh, there were more frequent um, uh, updates as well. Uh, to cater to the different uh, requirements, um, uh, you know that 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 should be there for compliance, uh, and obviously for vendors like us uh, who were implementing multiple standards, um, you know some of these versions came very close to each other um, from different standards, so that was quite challenging. Uh, first, to be on top of all those changes, but also to get the required clarifications from the different uh, standards bodies and also implement them uh, in parallel. Um, uh, and in terms of the UK banks themselves, uh, obviously this, the, there, was a, there was a distinction between the CMA9 and the non-CMA9 uh, banks and uh, some, of the, some, of the, some of their requirements were different, I believe, uh, I believe Chris. Uh, from a bank's perspective, from some of the banks we were working with, there were instances where some of the non-CMA9 banks were not sure, uh, you know, whether certain requirements and certain deadlines applied to them. Um, I, I know there were several roadmaps uh, and updates to those roadmaps that were available, but it, it was still, um, I suppose, um, not very clear sometimes. Um, and I believe, uh, you know, that there, there may have been other challenges from the perspectives of the third parties connecting to these uh, these two different groups uh, that, that you might be able to um, uh, elaborate on. Yeah, I mean... I Un, under the under the 
the CMA order. Um, the, the order requires, as I mentioned earlier, the CMA 9 to implement the standard. Um, and it requires the CMA 9 to implement certain bits of that. So there's a kind of a, a roadmap of functionality that that is required to be implemented by, by the CMA 9. And that doesn't exist um, for non-CMA9. All that exists for non-CMA9 is in, in this regard is PSD2 and the RTS. Um, so it, it has been kind of challenging because non-CMA9 banks have obviously wanted to adopt and use the, the the standard that we've created because they've seen that as a you know a good a good standard to uh, adhere to and will give them a a good chance of meeting their kind of regulatory obligations. Um, and uh, but but I yeah I can see that from a bank's point of view there there have been some some a non CMA nine bank's point of view some some challenges about which bits of it do they have to implement um, and we we're not in a position and we don't give legal or regulatory or compliance advice to people we just basically say here is the standard and if you're the CMA nine under the CMA order you have to do this. Um, but for non-CMA9 banks, all we can do is encourage them to adopt as much of the standard as possible and yeah. obviously to talk to the regulator. And then from from the, the TPP's bit, it's also from their side, it's also challenging because they don't know what to um, expect from, uh, you know, they, they, they probably have a more clarity about what to expect from the CMA9. And if the CMA9 do something that is you know, not working or not, you know, not deemed to be in line with the standard or that, you know, there's a performance issue or something, then the OBIE does have some uh, role there to um, obligate the banks to meet the standard or take some extra steps. So the, 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 uh, un, un, the, uh, the, the kind of under the framework of, of OBIE, there is some pressure that OBIE can put on, on banks, but we don't have that same uh, ability to influence anything that non-CMA9 banks do. So from a TPP point of view, they might see a non-CMA9 bank that isn't doing something that they think they should be, and we can raise that and encourage a conversation, but we don't have any uh, sort of uh, um, uh, any control ultimately over what non-CMA9 banks do. Right, right, I got it. Um, do you also want to touch on, uh, you know, some of the challenges that third parties have had, um, you know, especially in terms of customer experiences and also uh, the non-conformance or lack of conformance standards by the banks? Yeah, so um, I think the um, I think the, uh, the 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 kind of key challenge um, we've we we've had. So very early on, I think, is that um, when when banks first implemented open banking back in January last year, January 2018, the customer experience was by and large pretty poor. I mean, it was uh, you know we it was based on a redirect model. Banks were looking at implementing strong customer authentication, but if, for example, you but what they weren't doing is using the existing authentication processes or methods. Um, that they, you know, that's an existing customer would use. So, for example, if you um, uh, a year ago, if you were banking with a, a bank and you would log on to your bank using a mobile app using your face or thumb uh, uh, touch ID or face ID, um, you would um, probably not even know your username, let alone your password. And you know that that has become predominant method of access for a large number of consumers. And it's very convenient. It offers good security, good customer experience, low friction. And the journey that all the banks started off implementing was, you know, redirecting to a standalone website that required the customer to enter username, password, which typically wouldn't have even been stored in a browser, um, and also required quite often a second factor authentication which would have been not a biometric, it might have required a pin sentry device or even a phone call in some cases. So, you know, the, the journey was very high friction, huge, huge amount of drop off. And the regulations and the clarifications have, I think, been relatively clear on this, that, you know, the, the, the opinion of the regulators across Europe, including the FCA here, is that, that 
banks have to make available the same authentication method. So our interpretation of that in the customer experience guidelines was um, if customers use their mobile app, use their face to authenticate, they should be able to do the same for a TPP journey. And so we put a lot of pressure on, we put that into our customer experience guidelines and put a lot of pressure on the CMA9. They've largely implemented that now. And so what we've got to is a situation where, um, you know, pretty much unique across the rest of Europe, pretty much all of the banks now, not just CMA9, or other banks now are implementing biometric authentication. We call it app to app, but you know, where customers have got a mobile app. And they're they're using the same process that they allow customers to authenticate when they go direct via a TPP. And that that is a big step forward from where we were a year or so ago. Um, it's almost non-existent across Europe. Most most banks haven't implemented that across Europe and and it's a, a lot of uh, complaints from the TPPs about the friction in the process. So we kind of made head ground. That works very well for account information. I think the key thing that we've got is that there's some differences of opinion, and I'm going to sit on the fence a little bit here about what that means for payments. So if if the payment scenario is replacing what a customer does in their online channel at the moment, i.e., I'm going to my banking app and I'm going to pay a friend or pay a supplier or pay a tax bill or a, a gas bill or something. Typically, I go online and I go into my banking app or website and I enter the details of who I'm paying and I enter the amount, sort code, account number, amount, name, etc., and I make the payment by credit transfer. Might be faster payments, might be backs. Now, open banking payments, I would argue, offer a much better customer experience, especially if you do app to app, because the customer, the PISP can control all of that and the, the, the customer just has to authenticate and or select their account they make the payment from. I would say that's a step forward, a better customer experience, less error, less opportunity for error. Um, and uh, so therefore it will be you know, less, less fraud, less missed payments, misdirected payments. I think that's a positive step forward. And I would argue that largely what the banks are implementing now, although there are still some issues around performance and availability, but largely what the banks are implementing now is a good equivalent and is a better alternative than a manual payment method using an online channel. The point, the, the point of friction um, is around uh, the other extreme where people have a perception that open banking APIs will replace cards and card payments. And that's partly about customer experience. It's also about you know, commercial models as well. So customer experience, you know, you're, you're at the moment, a lot of card payments use cards on file or continuous payments authority type payments, where the, once the customer sets something up, ongoing payments are very friction free. You could argue they're too friction free. And that's, you know, there's obviously the strong customer authentication for cards uh, discussion, which we're not going to have today. But, you know, certainly... Yeah. There are issues around customer experience is not as good as cards and certainly not as good as things like Apple Pay or Google Pay. So there is some work to do to make online payments as good or a good alternative for e-commerce and points of sale. It, in my view, it has to be as good as Apple Pay or Google Pay. In my view, it could be as good as Apple Pay or Google Pay. It's not, you know, either it needs to be a regulatory requirement for banks to do this or there needs to be a good commercial incentive for banks. Um, but ultimately, the biggest issue, perhaps, in all of this is even with all of those things in place, there needs to be some customer protection because you get protection to some extent, certainly in the UK with cards and direct debit and some of these other methods that offer a friction-free experience. You get customer protection if there's a, an issue like you know, the holiday company goes bust, for example, as happened recently. If you mm. paid out of open banking and the money's gone straight out of your account with faster payments and you then got a dispute and the merchant's gone bust what do you do and that's yeah. that's a kind of challenge that um open banking in in the generic sense needs to needs to kind of sort out if if these apis are going to be a good alternative yeah that's quite true um I think um, just to round off the challenges uh, from the bank's perspective um, as well. Um, uh, I think the you know in terms of the regulatory clarifications, this this issue was uh, more prevalent in in the rest of Europe 
uh, than in the UK. Um, because obviously there are lots of regulatory clarifications um, as well as clarifications around the standards. Uh, and in the UK, um, you know, for, for what you know, we, we had the OBIE and uh, the, the different channels uh, were available both to the vendors as well as the banks themselves uh, that, you know, they could approach and um, get certain clarifications. And, and the OBIE, in, in, um, while they do not provide um, guidance on regulatory compliance, rather, uh, you know, compliance with standards, um, you know, many of the um, clarifications that they were able to make really clarified certain aspects of the regulation as well. Uh, however, for most of the European banks, they did not have uh, a similar uh, entity to approach, uh, especially with regards to interpreting certain elements of the RTS. Uh, and, and, and the different NCAs had, you know, different channels. Many did not have approachable or public channels, uh, and, and therefore it was quite a challenge to get answers for um, continuous questions um, regarding the applicability of, this, of the regulation. Uh, I think we already uh, spoke about the CMA 9, uh, and, and, and I thank Chris for giving a um, uh, sort of clarifying that for us. Uh, I think around the, uh, uh, you know, MI requirements, reporting requirements, uh, there was a bit of a confusion around uh, that as well. I, I think there are some clarifications that remain uh, required. Uh, where banks are really wondering whether it's mandatory, uh, the MI reporting specification is still not, uh, you know, released publicly. Uh, what is the roadmap around it, etc.? Chris, do you have any um, any sort of guidance for us around that? Yeah. So, I mean, we we um, uh, so there, there is a, a, a regulatory requirement to report to publish statistics uh, and report to the FCA or to report to the regulator. That's a PSD2 RTS requirement. Um, what we have created is um, a MI specification which enables that and what we um, what we are encouraging is we're encouraging banks to um, non CMA9 banks to use the uh, the open banking um, standard uh, for MI reporting there isn't a requirement to do that um, on you know to, to, to submit that to open banking but what we're encouraging banks to do is to use our MI requirements and submit statistics to us so that we can get a good overall picture of all of the banks, not just the CMA9. Uh, we do have a, there is a regulatory requirement or a, certainly a requirement that the CMA9 have to, have to submit statistics to, um, uh, to open banking uh, for MI, but uh, we're, we're trying to get non-CMA9 to do it as well. There isn't a requirement, but it, we would very much like it because it helps us get a, an overview of the state and the health of the ecosystem. Yeah, got it. All right, thanks for that. Um, okay, so moving on and looking ahead. Um, I think, um, Chris, would you like to uh, quickly uh, tell us uh, your, you know, you know, what's going on currently, what plans for the future, etc. Um, yes, yeah, so we are, um, we're looking at um, first doing two things really. One is evolving the standard. I've kind of touched on this before. Um, at the start, but there, there are kind of some on day cla ongoing clarifications, and we're looking at things like 90 day reauthentication. Um, there are some things for the CMA order which are still not in the standard around things like refunds of variable recurring payments. There's some things that are coming in, in, in the UK around confirmation of pay and contingent reimbursement models, sort of warnings. Um, so we're looking at all of these things, and I mentioned sort of premium APIs as well. Um, now, some of this is clearly within the remit of OBIE. Some of it, there are some differences of opinion. I'm not going to get into the details, but you know, the, the bottom line is there is still work to do to evolve the standard, uh, either for a regulatory reason or to help facilitate uh, some of these kind of issues in the market, like 90-day reauthentication. Um, and in parallel with that, we're trying to encourage more ASPSPs, more TPPs to both uh, use the standard and enter the ecosystem. Uh, we've got things like a proposition that we're working on for technical service providers 
Uh, how can we help? You know, we have, I think, over 100 technical service providers such as WSO2 uh, who are um, providing different types of technical solution in the markets, and we want to encourage that because that will help everyone. Um, and then dispute management is a, we're, we're, we have a basic dispute management system. I think we're about to launch a more advanced one to help. It doesn't solve all of the end customer issues, but it will help banks and third parties resolve issues uh, around a customer complaint, for example. So th these are kind of the key highlights of what, what we're working on till the end of this year and, and probably th throughout 2020. Right, thank you. Um, all right, so I actually want to talk about an interesting development uh, we are seeing uh, towards digital transformation um, within our um, open banking customer base. It's sort of like an indirect um, consequence of uh, open banking, I feel. Uh, and we see this especially uh, in the tier two, uh, tier three, and the building societies. Um, so before we talk about that, um, if I just, you know, uh, recap the different components that are required for a, a bank to, uh, you know, be compliant with PSD2 or open banking, uh, obviously uh, we've categorized them uh, into four areas, API management for, um, uh, you know, exposing the APIs to handle the API security, the third party onboarding, all of that, and identity and access management for uh, authentication and consent management, integration to integrate with um, co banking systems, and analytics for things like um, transaction risk analysis, fraud detection, business insights, etc. Um, so uh, now, while banks have uh, taken taken up these different components to solve the various aspects of open banking. Um, they have really started reviewing some of the existing problems in their technology stacks that they can address through these components. So if we uh, take a look at some of the very obvious um, uh, problems. Now, uh, spaghetti architectures, it seems like a problem of the 80s, but unfortunately for most banks that have been around for many long years, um, and who have adopted many different legacy systems along the way uh, for critical functionalities, this problem unfortunately still exists. Um, uh, and similarly, um, uh, multiple identities, uh, along with these uh, different legacy systems, it was added to the mix. Um, it, 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 the, the siloed identities came along with that, and, and that required employees as well as customers uh, to have to maintain multiple sets of credentials, or at the very least, multiple logins to access different systems. And similarly, uh, as a result um, of the siloed components, data was generated in silos as well, and there was difficulty in creating uh, insights by using a universal uh, so data lake uh, that is able to aggregate data uh, for a single customer across many systems. Um, but the development that we see happening is that especially uh, for the tier two, tier three banks, uh, they are making use of these new components that they have invested in for open banking, uh, such as the API gateway or the integration layer or the advanced um, IAM platform. Um, to really digitize the internal technology stack uh, so that better value could be derived through a well integrated and agile technology architecture that can potentially reduce costs and increase business potential. Um, so we are seeing, uh, we, we are getting, um, you know, expansions of our projects as well, where, uh, you know, banks are expanding from using these components uh, not just for open banking requirements, but also to get their internal architectures in a much more agile manner. Um, and with that, I think um, uh, as, as we come very close to uh, the end of the webinar, we'd also like to finally talk about the new opportunities and business models that have, that have been created as a result uh, of the open banking ecosystem. Um, I think the role of banks uh, are truly changing uh, and the ecosystem as originally promised is giving opportunities to many uh, other organizations to provide better financial services through the API ecosystem. Um, 
So, uh, Chris, would you like to explain some of the newer customer journeys that you are seeing, uh, especially with these third parties that uh, are using the OB APIs um, uh, presently? Yeah, I mean, I think I think the um, uh, the the things that we're seeing right now, and I kind of alluded to this earlier, but um, uh, we're seeing um, you know tools like uh, the the first the first um, TPP to go live in the market with Open Bank APIs um, last year was uh, Yolt, which is a, a actually a, um, a subsidiary of uh, ING Bank. So, uh, but um, you know, Yolt is a is a free application. It's a really good personal finance manager. There are a number of them in the market, but um, you know that's a kind of obvious use case for open banking, where it's much easier now and more secure to connect multiple apps to um, uh, multiple bank accounts to your personal finance manager. We're seeing all the business accounting packages looking to kind of come into this space as well. Um, I think you know it's a much a much better experience rather than sharing usernames and passwords, for example. Um, uh, the um, uh, we're we're seeing things like use case I mentioned on lending. So um, companies like uh, an example, HSBC can now offer loans to customers who don't bank with them by, um, and this kind of is. Uh, actually falls into a new business model as well, but you know the um, bank acting is effectively a TPP, so they're allowing customers who bank with another bank to connect via open banking to their other bank account with another bank, validate income and expenditure, and then HSBC can offer them a loan. So we're seeing those sorts of kind of use cases coming into the market now. I think I think the the really innovative stuff around combining account information with payments I think is still dependent on there's some work to do as I mentioned earlier around payments and how you know what's the either regulatory requirement or commercial incentive for banks to offer really useful payment APIs I think that's that's something that could could really be powerful and I think some of the players who are looking to drive that in this space are the big tech players, the big, you know, um, you know, the Apples and Googles and Samsungs with their kind of wallets, and then potentially some of the big social networks. I think if you look at what happens in other markets like sort of India and um, China and Singapore with with payments and how how you know payment payments can be enabled in some of those markets. Some of that could could really be built on top of open banking APIs and gets gets really exciting. I suppose that the, the kind of last point, you know, we've seen a huge growth. I mentioned there's about 100 TSPs, technical service providers in the market. Quite a few of those are API aggregators. There's been a huge growth in API aggregators. They're doing a combination of technical connectivity and also uh, data enrichment. Um, and those that that's a kind of new business model that we've seen. Um, but ultimately, I think the, this is a big, both a threat and an opportunity for banks, because if you've got a great API, or you've got an API, then uh, and you have huge demand for that API, uh, is your core system of record, your banking system, fit for purpose for an API ecosystem? So what we're seeing is that there are a number of banks who are looking at this as a catalyst and potentially a business case for them to uh, invest further or replatform their existing core systems. And I think that's going to be quite an interesting uh, 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 concept as that plays out. Yeah, that's true. Um, and also, I just want to mention the new business models that are uh, coming up uh, as a result of this ecosystem. Um, you mentioned it as well, um, uh, you know, with a reference to HSBC uh, providing loans to the non-customers. Uh, so the banks basically um, acting as third party uh, providers. Um, I, I think it's also enabling them to build an even stronger relationship with their existing customers as well um, as you know uh, as well as uh, attracting newer customers uh, because um, for existing customers that gives the bank uh, the ability to now get the customers consent uh, to understand their consolidated financial picture uh, by um, accessing their uh, data from other banks uh, and as a result providing a much more tailor-made uh, customized service to their customers. 
Um, and then um, the API aggregators is, a, is an interesting um, you know, economy sort of that is uh, coming up uh, due to the different standards that the, um, these different um, regions are uh, using to expose these APIs. Uh, obviously, data aggregation has become a nightmare for, for TPPs uh, who need to navigate different types of standards, uh, as well as um, not just API formats, but also uh, different uh, authentication mechanisms, etc., uh, before they're able to really add value uh, to the customer. Um, and, and with the API aggregators we've seen come to their rescue, uh, where they map these different API standards and provide a unified API. Uh, so that the third-party applications are able to consume uh, data from multiple banks uh, using the same, using uh, sort of the sort of a unified API. Uh, and and I and I have seen that these organisations have become very popular uh, as well as successful uh, in in a short period of time. Uh, and then uh, we see the banking technology space. Uh, changing as well. Banks are now acting more like technology companies, uh, adding value through technology components as well as new business avenues that are available to them as a result of the API economy. Uh, we are also seeing the proliferation of digital only banks uh, and banking as a service and other similar models. Um, so I think open banking has really taken the banking technology space to a different level altogether. All right, so. Um, I think, Chris, between the two of us, we've covered quite a bit uh, of the journey taken by uh, almost all the open banking stakeholders, uh, as, as well as what's ahead of us. Um, and we hope that all those uh, who've joined us from uh, Europe, as well as other regions, um, have you know, really benefited uh, from all this experience. Um, and we'd like to, um, I know we've run out of time, but we'd like to just open up for maybe just one or two questions. Okay, I think we have a question. Uh, what is the FAPI profile? So it's it's the uh, it's called the Financial Grade API. Uh, this is by the um, OpenID Foundation. Uh, I think Chris provided quite a quite a good um, uh, sort of introduction to what that profile is. You will be able to um, read about it if you just uh, go on to the uh, OpenID. Foundation's website and just look for the FAPI profile. Yeah, if you if you look at either the Open ID Foundation's website or if you go on to the Open Banking uh, OpenBanking.org.uk our, our website and you look at the uh, standards section, there's a standards microsite and it link takes you through to the FAPI profile. Um, I think there's just one other question we are able to take. Uh, due to the time constraint. Um, how is uh, OBIE involved in contributing to other standards, uh, such as Australia, Mexico, Bahrain, etc.? Chris, do you want to answer that? Yeah, sure. So, um, I mean, the, the first thing is that the, 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 all of the standards are open. So what we've seen is that many of these other markets, uh, Sashika mentioned, either taking, adopting the, the whole standard or taking it as the basis. Um, we we are reasonably proactive, um, not as uh, not 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 maybe as much as I would like, but we are actively talking to regulators and standards bodies in lots of other markets, including uh, we're working with Swift um, to work together with Berlin Group and Stet. I think you know we we've all got this vision of having a single global interoperable standard. Um, I think the first starting point is, and the most important point that we would like to very strongly encourage every market to just adopt the, 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 the FAPI standard from uh, OpenID uh, Foundation. Um, we think um, you know that's that's the starting place. And if 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 people want to uh, uh, iterate or build on that standard, they should join the OpenID Foundation and contribute and collaborate with with them, and as we do as well. So you know that's that's the kind of first pass, and then on the functional APIs, it's very much you know we we would really like to collaborate with other standards bodies in other markets. We're doing quite a lot of work in that. I think it's a, an ongoing activity throughout 2020 and beyond, probably. 
All right. I'm just going to take just one last question because it's a uh, it's it's uh, it's a question from uh, Sri Lanka. Um, it says, "Is there anyone setting standards for APIs?" Um, so actually, in Sri Lanka, um, I believe it was in 2018, uh, the central bank um, uh, launched a fintech regulatory sandbox, uh, and they are going through different um, different aspects of uh, fintech regulation uh, and what. Uh, one of the areas that they're currently working on, and we're involved in that as well, is um, uh, the op an open banking roadmap for Sri Lanka. Um, so that's on the cards, uh, and, and we will see how that uh, turns out. Um, the questions are really um, <laughs> coming in their drones. Um, I think I'll just answer this one as well because it's interesting. What is the recommendation for other parts of the world, um, for example, Asia? Should they wait for their own standard or follow PSD2? I think Chris and I might have different opinions on it. Uh, my opinion is that uh, we're seeing uh, banks, uh, even in countries where open banking has not um, sort of taken ground, uh, banks exposing APIs um, because they see the benefits of an open banking ecosystem. System. And, and what we've seen is when one bank does it, uh, the others um, also kind of um, follow suit rather quickly. And something we recommend for countries like that, where the regulation you know, has not started, is to go with a standard that is well established, uh, like the UK standard, because um, as we've been discussing right throughout the webinar, you know, the UK standards uh, is becoming more and more global. Um, so opening up APIs um, should be done, in my opinion, uh, without waiting for a standard, if that is getting delayed. And the best, no, I, uh, sorry, regulation. No, um, yeah, as I said, I totally agree. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right, so unfortunately, I think we'll, we'll just have to uh, finish up the webinar as we've run out. Uh, but um, all the uh, other questions, you can feel free to write to us. Uh, you can write to me, sashika at wso2.com, uh, send your questions in. Um, so um, I guess uh, it's time to wrap up. Um, Thank you, Chris, for participating in the webinar, but also for the continuous support uh, you and as well as you, you as well as your team uh, at OBIE have given us throughout the PSD2 journey. And I hope our attendees um, had a, a, uh, enjoyed a fruitful discussion today. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye bye.